corners of the earth and the far corridors of history. Dateline, World War II. Seven December 1941, South Pacific. In the pre-dawn hours, a Japanese naval task force under the command of Vice Admiral Trichi Nagumo steams 275 miles north of the United States Pacific Fleet Base at Pearl Harbor. Sailing undetected under the cover of a storm front, Nagumo is now in position to strike the first all-important blow in the Japanese plan to eliminate U.S. power in the Pacific. As the first wave of attack planes rolls off the decks of Nagumo's six carriers, the soldiers and sailors at Pearl Harbor are awakening to a beautiful Sunday morning. Weekend duty, playing ball, going to church. The war in Europe is of little concern to them, and Japanese aggression in China is even less a threat. They count their blessings for being stationed at Pearl and look forward to yet another day in the glorious Hawaiian sunshine. Commanders at Pearl have been warned that relations with the Japanese could quickly deteriorate into war. Fearing sabotage more than air attack, they group planes together on the runway, so they will be easier to protect. They issue a sabotage alert to the fleet, but even this only leaves one in four gunners at their positions, and their ammunition is locked away. It will prove a costly mistake. At 6.45, a mobile radar operator picks up the inbound Japanese planes and reports them to the duty officer. Assuming it is the flight of B-17s expected to arrive this morning, the officer does not report the contact. At 7.55, the Japanese planes appear in the skies over Pearl Harbor. The airfields on the island are the first hit. Planes grouped together for protection make easy targets for the highly skilled Japanese pilots. Most are destroyed before they ever have a chance to leave the ground. The alert is sounded at 7.58. Air raid, Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. As soldiers and sailors scramble to their guns, the Japanese are already raining destruction down on the ships, sitting like ducks in the harbor. Battleship Row is the main focus of the Japanese attack. With seven battleships lined up neatly in two rows, it is simply target practice for the Japanese. The California takes two torpedoes and begins to settle. Within minutes, she is engulfed in flames. The order is given, abandon ship. Again and again, the Japanese dive on the helpless ships. The Oklahoma takes four torpedoes and capsizes. A bomb drops down the funnel of the Arizona and detonates in the forward magazine. She virtually explodes. Men, desperate to escape the doomed ship, dive over the side into the water that is covered in burning oil. About 8.30, the first wave of Japanese planes begins to retire. The respite is brief. At 8.45, the second wave hits the already crippled fleet. They focus on the dry dock where an eighth battleship, the Pennsylvania, sits helplessly. The Nevada, which was damaged in the first wave, has managed to get underway and move into the harbor, but is quickly targeted and hit several times by the Japanese bombers. With the help of two tugboats, the captain runs the ship aground to keep her from sinking. As the Japanese second wave retires into the morning sun, battleship Row is a shambles. Three of the dreadnoughts are sunk. One is afire and sinking, another one is grounded, and all the others are severely damaged. In all, 18 ships have been sunk or crippled. On the island, 188 planes have been destroyed. Over 2,400 soldiers, sailors, and Marines who three short hours ago were reveling in the Hawaiian sun have been killed in the attack. Almost half of these died when the Arizona exploded. On 8 December, President Roosevelt addresses the nation. Yesterday, 
December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleagues delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. The bold and daring strike by the Japanese has earned them a glorious victory, but it has also solidified the American public as no other act could have. Although there are surely dark days ahead, Americans everywhere, especially the survivors at Pearl Harbor, look forward eagerly to their day of retribution. Seven December, 1941, the Russian front. As the world reels at the news of the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, thousands of miles away, events are unfolding that, while largely ignored by the press, are no less monumental. For the last 24 hours, the front directly to the west of Moscow, where the Germans had driven within sight of the Kremlin, has been ablaze with Russian artillery and tank fire. The German commanders, who at first considered this a limited and localized action, have now begun to realize that it is much more. It is becoming clear that, despite their belief that the Red Army was too tired and their resources too depleted to mount a meaningful assault, this is the beginning of a carefully planned counteroffensive, one for which they are ill-prepared and will likely be unable to repulse. This counteroffensive is the opening move of a well-planned and perfectly timed plot led by Marshal Georgi Zukov and Joseph Stalin to turn back the Germans, thereby saving Moscow and, in effect, the Soviet Union itself. For months, Stalin has been holding men and equipment in reserve despite the devastating advances being made by the enemy. Also, when it became clear in late October that the Japanese intended to wage war in the Pacific rather than focus on their drive into China, Stalin began moving troops from Siberia west to Moscow. Having gathered the necessary men and materiel, Zhukov and Stalin waited for the right time to launch their attack, the moment when the Nazi troops, having advanced too quickly to establish adequate supply lines and ill-equipped for a winter battle they were never supposed to fight, would be the most vulnerable. On 29 November, the harshest winter in years pushed temperatures to 30 degrees below zero. German troops began freezing to death and their trucks and tanks became immobilized. A confident Zhukov reported to Stalin 
The enemy has been bled white. But time had come. Now the Russian armies directly in front and to the north and south of Moscow are unleashing their fury and doing what no military, political, or diplomatic force has been able to do since Hitler began his rise to power in 1933. They are forcing the Nazis to retreat. For the first few days, the battle is hard fought and the gains are small. But by 11 December, the Red Army's progress is such that Stalin feels confident enough to announce that the German advance on Moscow has been halted, and Soviet troops have taken the offensive, driving the Nazis back hundreds of miles in some places and liberating over 400 towns and villages in the process. For the Russian people, who have had little to celebrate since the invasion began, there is at last good news from the front. While the Germans are not beaten, they have been driven from the steps of the Kremlin, and this is enough to bolster the faith of a nation hungry for hope. By 18 December, the offensive has played out. The Red Army, having gained all its initial objectives, now awaits reinforcements, while in Berlin, the German High Command reports, erroneously, that the harsh winter has forced the Wehrmacht to fall back and take up defensive positions. So while the rest of the world focuses on the Japanese attack and America's entry into the war, they have overlooked an event the consequences of which may be no less monumental. After years of unbridled aggression and unchecked advances, the dominion of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich, rather than expanding, has been diminished. 8 December 1941, the Philippines. Only hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a flight of Japanese bombers appears over Clark Air Base. The Japanese are able to destroy an invaluable squadron of B-17s and escape almost unscathed. Though Pearl Harbor was the first Japanese attack on the United States, the action in the Philippines is the real beginning of a coordinated attack on American assets in the Pacific. For the next two days, Japanese naval aircraft mount hit-and-run attacks on American positions, targeting, in particular, aircraft and air bases. To General Douglas MacArthur, the Governor General of the Philippines, it is obvious that the Japanese are preparing to invade the islands. That prospect cannot help but disturb MacArthur, who knows that the American and Philippine forces on the islands are poorly equipped and, in many cases, badly trained. An old Philippine hand, MacArthur feels virtually certain that the invasion will come along the Lingayan Gulf on northern Luzon. On 9 December, however, the Japanese land an expeditionary force at Apari in the extreme north. A second force lands at Vigan in the northwest. The move is intended to draw American forces, limited though they are, away from Lingayan so that the real Japanese invasion will meet less resistance. MacArthur and General Jonathan Wainwright, his most experienced combat general, agree that the landings at Apari and Vigan are diversions and hold their ground. As the days pass and the Japanese continue their relentless bombing attacks, it becomes clear that the Philippines are virtually defenseless. The American High Command, fearing the total destruction of air assets in the Philippines, ordered the surviving bombers to pull back to the safety of Australia. On 12 December, the Japanese land a third force, this at Lugaspi on the southeastern end of the island. It seems to many as if this must be the real invasion. Again, the call goes out for reinforcements, and again, MacArthur refuses to bite, ordering his troops at all invasion points to fight and fall back, to delay the Japanese advance, but not risk being cut off. It is not until 10 days later, 22 December, but the main invasion force finally arrives, as predicted, in the Lingayan Gulf. The armada is larger than anyone had expected. 80 Japanese ships dropping anchor and disgorging thousands upon thousands of Japanese troops. Wainwright, the commander at Lingayan, is ordered, like other commanders facing the Japanese on the island, to fight and fall back. The plan is for all American forces to fall back to the Bataan Peninsula as defensible a region of Luzon as there is. The withdrawal will be tricky. MacArthur puts together an exacting schedule that prevents any forces from being cut off and annihilated. The American defenders, divided by MacArthur into two forces, fight and fall back. 
After only a few days of fighting, the Japanese forces have linked up and begin to drive down the 40-mile-wide Central Valley toward the Philippine capital of Manila. The largest of the two forces is in the north. The 28,000 men commanded by Wainwright face off against the main body of Japanese troops, led by Lieutenant General Masaharu Homa. The American Southern Force, commanded by Brigadier General Albert Jones, faces off against 10,000 Japanese troops. Homa's armies advance with a ferocity that is pushing Wainwright back well ahead of MacArthur's exacting schedule. Wainwright knows that if he reaches Bataan ahead of schedule, Homa's troops will effectively cut off Jones' escape from the south. Jones abandons Manila after MacArthur, who has spent much of his life in the islands, declares the city open, thus sparing it weeks of devastating bombing and house-to-house -house fighting. As Jones leaves, the Japanese choose to occupy the city rather than pursuing the retreating Americans. This allows the orderly retreat to continue, virtually guaranteeing that the two American armies will arrive simultaneously at Bataan. What the retreating armies don't know, however, is that in the crucial days of their retreat, virtually no steps have been taken to fortify Bataan. MacArthur, for reasons unknown, has not given the order to dig trenches, prepare artillery emplacements, and cut supply trails. Food and supplies scattered around Luzon, which should have been concentrated behind the American fallback position, are not. As Wainwright, Jones, and their American armies fall back, they don't realize that the safe haven of Bataan may be anything but. Twelve December, 1941, in the murky depths of the North Atlantic, a German submarine commander quietly stalks his prey. Above him is a convoy of merchant ships, heavy with war material, bound for the British Isles. Unleashing his torpedoes, he scores three direct hits. The flimsy hulls of the ships buckle with the explosions, sending the men and their precious cargo to the bottom of the sea. The sub-commander then quietly slips away to await the next target to cross his path. For the men shuttling the ships back and forth across the Atlantic, this is becoming an increasingly common occurrence. The commercial sea lanes have become the latest target in Hitler's quest for European domination. Though the German Navy is no match for the mighty British fleet, it has the good sense to avoid outright confrontation. Instead, they strike at the merchant ships that carry the supplies so critical to Britain's ability to wage war. The British realize that above all, they must avoid isolation. Escorting the convoys with battleships or heavy cruisers has diminished the toll taken by German surface raiders, but the stealthy submarines continue to wreak havoc with the vital shipping. Already this year, the subs have sunk over three and a half million tons of British shipping. One convoy leaves the U.S. with 30 ships and arrives in England with only nine. The sub-commander's favorite tactic is to attack from the surface in the middle of the convoy at night. By the time the destroyers react, the damage is done. The sub quietly slips away. Increased destroyer escorts and patrol flights out of Iceland have helped battle the subs, and the United States, despite its supposed neutrality, began escorting the convoys as far as Iceland before its entry into the war. Despite these efforts, the subs have still been devastatingly effective. While the RAF's air battles have captured their hearts, the survival of the British people may now depend more on the ability of their navy to fend off the German wolf packs. That will require the British to win a naval war the likes of which has never been fought.